Three Coins is a tale of adventure, intrigue, and of the forbidden love of A Ying on the left and Lai Wall on the right. Their saga is intertwined with the history of the American West. Let's begin the saga of A Ying and Lai Wall with a truly American story. This is the building of the Transcontinental Railroad, which required the heroic efforts of 16,000 Chinese men with simple hand tools, hammers, drills, picks, axes, and blasting powder, they created a railroad through some of the harshest landscape in North America. This was a feat which most people thought would be impossible. My great-grandfather Lai Wall and all of the other Transcontinental Railroad workers wanted to start families in America. To do this, they needed to find a wife and a mother for their children. The problem was there were almost no Chinese women in America. This story really brings me now to the most heroic person in Three Coins, and this is Lula Ying, my great-grandmother. Without her fierce determination to find freedom and to find love, I would not be here today. A Ying was born into the Tom family in Boxar Village in 1871. She is eager, energetic, full of life. She brings joy into the family, but food and money are scarce because of a string of wars, rebellions, droughts, and very poor harvests. And in this world of incredible poverty, her parents do the unthinkable. However, don't feel too sorry for Lila Ying because this young girl was determined. She never gave up hope that she could find freedom and could find love. In the 1880s, she met a young man. Of course, this is Lai Wall, our transcontinental railroad worker. The two of them have a friendship which blossoms into a young romance. And after six miserable years as a Moisai, the two of them plot her escape. Now it turns out that the ripples of a Ying's three coins, the ripples of her survival, continue to this very day to impact all of our lives. Ultimately, each of us can trace our roots back to these two people, a teenage railroad worker and a Chinese slave girl rescued by missionaries. Their incredible story of resilience and courage and overcoming hardship is not a Chinese story. It's truly an American and an international story. Hello dear Oli students, I'm sending you greetings to sunny California from sunny Florida. <laughs> I am Annette Isaacs, I am a German historian and public educator and I'm really thrilled to be back via Zoom uh, for a one-time program. It's going to be a two-hour class on February 17th at 3.30 your time and that will be very timely. It's actually called Germany's Promised Land, an update on the refugee crisis because you might know that uh, seven years Years ago, or now it's like six and a half or so years ago, Angela Merkel, our chancellor, our former chancellor, she is not the chancellor anymore, she opened up the German borders in order to let in over one million refugees from uh, war-torn countries like Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. And that really also changed, you know, Germany quite a bit. And we're going to talk about this. And we're also going to talk about how uh, many of these refugees are faring in uh, today's Germany and how the Germans reacted to the fact that, um, of course, so many uh, foreigners, if you want to call them that, uh, were coming to uh, my home country. And I'm really hoping that you're all going to uh, sign up for that and that you're all going to show up on February 17th at 3.30, your time. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Thank you so much, bye-bye.
Hello, I'm Kate Nelson. I'm coming to you from my work from home office in Placitas, New Mexico. This is where most of my magic happens on behalf of New Mexico Magazine, where I'm the managing editor. I moved to New Mexico in 1989 and have since then indulged in a variety of what I can only call nerd domains. They include hiking, archeology, span wildflowers, history, and the art and artists of the Southwest. A few years ago, I was honored to write a biography of Helen Harden. She was part of the 1970s, 1980s vanguard of Native American artists who pushed the art form out of traditional depictions and beyond trading posts and Indian fairs. They used abstraction, expressionism, current events, and even some 70s era psychedelia to reach a much larger audience. Their work and that of artists who came after them now stand in museums, galleries, and homes all around the world. That's part of a story I'll be telling in my class, which I title Three Women, One Story, and One Thousand Years of Native American Art. And I can do it in under an hour, I promise you. From early basketry and petroglyphs to today's groundbreaking artists, it's a story that is, yeah, about art, but it's also about Southwest history, culture, and some very special places out here. I have a subversive aim, and it's to tempt you into coming out here and having some adventures of your own. I will use a lot of images of art to tell this story, and I have a special treat at the end for participants. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you'll join me. Hello, my name is Teresa Bergman, and I'm a professor and chair of the communication department here at Pacific. I will be giving a lecture on Thursday, March 31st at 3.30 on my current research for my upcoming book, New Directions and Commemoration, Women, People of Color, and the Working Class Enter the U.S. Commemorative Landscape. I have written two previous books on commemoration in the United States, which led to this current research about sites of public memory that have new and interesting approaches to commemoration. Instead of relying on recognizing an individual, each of the sites that I chose to study commemorate the groups of people that contributed to the notable commemorative event. Three of the sites that I'm researching are located in New York, and they are the Lower East Side Tenement Museum, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Memorial, and the Women's Rights Pioneer Memorial. The other two sites are the Anthracite Heritage Museum in Lackawanna, Pennsylvania, and the Port Chicago Naval Magazine National Memorial that's located here in Richmond, California. I look forward to meeting each of you and discussing any questions that you may have. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about my lecture. I'm Bob Benedetti, Professor Emeritus at the University and now an independent researcher. My lecture will be a journey of 2,000 years of Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta history with its inhabitants as our guide. We begin with native peoples and then travel on voyages of discovery with Spanish explorers. The Spanish give way to rancheros who developed lands given them by the, Spanish, by the Mexican government then the voices of those traveling to the gold fields are overheard. As the riches of the gold fields dwindle, those competing for agricultural land dominate the conversations. Inventors will describe creating machines to tame the Delta. Townsfolk will talk of their diverse communities. Labor tensions will be uncovered and ethnic enclaves will be described. With prohibition, Delta visitors will celebrate a place of escape and relaxation. Then World War II will change the Delta forever. After the war, recreation comes to dominate with the marinas becoming the hub of congregation. More recently, 
Some have envisioned the Delta as key to California's water challenges, while others have emphasized its beauty and the preservation of its habitats. Looking to the future, observers imagine nature reclaiming the Delta and forcing a new settlement pattern on its inhabitants, possibly similar to the villages that native peoples inhabited long ago. During our journey, you will encounter writers, famous and those lost to history, but all of whom reflect on living in the Delta and taken together, help to define the Delta's sense of place. I hope you will join me. Hi everyone and Happy New Year. I'm Lisa Grotz, a UOP graduate from 1984. Now you know how old I am. I'm thrilled to be one of the speakers next spring on a very important topic called the etiquette of COVID and tips to stay afloat in a post COVID world. For the past 23 years, I have been an authority on etiquette and have done my best to dispense my pearls of wisdom which are compassion, consideration, and civility, all to help my clients and readers deal with business, social, and political situations. But then came COVID. In sickness and in health, the pandemic of 2020 changed the way we live, perhaps forever. The earth stood still and a handshake became a weapon and a face mask became the new normal. Now we need a proof of vaccination as our new passport. So I will give you ways to navigate sticky situations in communication, how to be a good neighbor, travel tips, and everyone's favorite topic, the unvaccinated. I look forward to our Zoom webinar. Till then, Happy New Year, stay safe, and come armed with lots of questions. Thank you.